Hello. All right, we are recording. Well, welcome folks to um, another in our series of presentations, workshop presentations, informative presentations on the uh, Plimpton Open Spaces Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Action Grant Open Space and Resilience Portfolio Workshops. Uh, and you guys have heard me speak a couple of times. You've heard uh, Eric Wahlberg and Neil Williams talk about our forests and our forest assets and our streamside forests, understory, and the importance of everything that's in our forests as far as being resilient. Then last month, you heard me and uh, Jim Newman from the State Healthy Soils Action Plan talk about dirt. Why? Because Jim and I are dirt guys. We decided that right off the bat. <laughs> and we talked about that heaven that's under your feet and that carpet that never seems to change with the grass and people say it's boring, it never changes. Well, we told you a little bit about the soils. And I really wanted to get Alex in tonight because one of the things that Jim led you guys to, and I noticed there was a lot of, a lot of eyebrows and ooze when Jim was talking about the types of soil that Plimpton has and he mentioned your peat and he mentioned bogs and he mentioned the tremendous impacts of bogs on natural systems. So he said, it's not only about your natural soil storage of carbon, it's about peat and what it can do. And in, a, in an ongoing series where we're trying to tie all of your natural systems into this investment strategy as to what's gonna make Plimpton more resilient in the future, bogs would be the next, next item because Plimpton is full of bogs also. And I couldn't think of a better person to get down here than Alex Hackman from the Division of Ecological Restoration here in the state. Alex manages the Cranberry Bog Restoration Program, but Alex is also a restoration ecologist and a watershed ecologist. But Alex is a dirt guy, which is like, so you got to follow two dirt guys with another dirt guy. And Alex is going to bring in his special perspective on his special kind of dirt. And the, the best thing about it is Alex really does tie everything together because if you look at a, a cranberry bog farm and system, you usually have bordering forest, edge habitat, upland and good upland soils, sand, and then you have the peat and the bogs, the wetlands, the whole bit. So Alex, where Alex works, brings it all together. And I think would really give you a good picture of what we can do in Plimpton. And Alex is not only about restoration and wetlands restoration, but it's about responsible land use alternatives for the town. Because a lot of times in our, our areas, these bogs are heritage landscapes, they define a town, and you wanna make sure you're making smart land use decisions that kind of honor the heritage of the town, work in concert with what the town is and what the town could be. And in this case, help Plimpton retain its resilience and hopefully increase its resilience potential moving into the future. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce my friend, Alex, and thank you profusely for coming to speak to us tonight. Thanks, Bill. I hope I can live up to that billing. That was a lot to live up to. Let me flip on my talk tonight, guys. Uh, let's see if I get into slideshow. Here to go. How's this looking? Can folks see this? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. So um, obviously here's what we're talking about tonight. Um, first of all, I wanna say thank you and tip my hat to the process that you all are going through to consider your resiliency portfolio, very impressive. You're clearly working with the right folks and the right person and Bill. And I'm really pleased to have this chance to speak with you. Um, like I said, Lindsay's has already got me excited to come down. So you don't have to set a hook, count me in for coming to see some things. So I'll try to give you an overview tonight of this perspective. And we're gonna talk about this. We're gonna talk about permanently protected, beautiful places. You know, places people can visit, enjoy, and that improve the lives of people living nearby in the community. And we're gonna talk about trying to transition sites into this that looked like this. And that's from, that's the same place that I took that last picture, I took this picture. And so what I hope tonight through this conversation is to try to inspire you, show you the ways that you can be part of making that change happen on places on the ground. Could I just quickly ask how many years in between? Yeah, I took this picture in, I think this was 2013. And that was, and then the, the last picture, that's 2010. 
but we started the restoration in 2009. Oh, cool. So that's one year after the earthwork. And that was right when I met the landowners. Thank you. The other thing I'm gonna to talk to you about is the people part of it tonight. These are um, our projects, as Bill said, uh, in, in heritage sites. So people are interested in what happens with them and you can build a lot of excitement um, promoting this positive change and the kind of future public uses that can be brought to bear on these landscapes. So the one takeaway I wanna to give to you is this one tonight. This is your math equation. This is your math assignment for tonight. It's that land protection plus wetland restoration is equals protected healthy natural areas. And if you have to duck away to go have dinner or anything else, this is what I want you to remember. And so we'll walk through what this looks like tonight. So with a little more detail, I'm gonna start just with some background, what's happening on the ground for context, lift up some of the risks and opportunities that presents across the region, talk about our specialty is restoration. We've had a, a good chance to think about these landscapes and do a bunch of projects and help transition lands to look like that. That's seven years after restoration at the first site we did in Plymouth with the town and others. Link that with land protection. I'm gonna to emphasize to you that land protection is a logical first step on these projects. And then I hope we get to close with some connections to your local work. I haven't had a lot, I'm gonna be upfront with you. I haven't had a lot of time to examine your study area. I do have it up on Google Earth. I have looked at some stuff happening in your, in your project area, but I'm really excited to learn more from you and interact with you around your ideas for what's happening there. So quick introduction, in case you don't know where I work, Department of Fish and Game, Division of Ecological Restoration. We have this gift of working for the people of the Commonwealth to try to affect proactive wetland and river restoration and protection, action-oriented and partnership-based. That's really the point I wanna get across to you is we're, our success is judged by completing projects and trying to do change on the ground. And these are the kind of projects we, we do. I lead the part of that division, the Cran Cranberry Bog Program. It's about three years old now. Um, it's me and one other staff person at this point. And beyond just letting you know there's a dedicated state program to this work, the second point I wanna make on this slide is that we are really joined at the hip with the United States Department of Agriculture's mm -hmm. Natural Resources Conservation Service. We're gonna talk a lot about land protection and restoration tonight and the marriage of the two. And that is our key federal partner to do that first part, the land protection part. And our, our work in this arena began about 15 years ago with our first project. And I'm showing it to you here. This is the Eel River Headwaters site in Plymouth. This is a town of Plymouth led project, um, two farms that were retired through a conservation easement that the town later purchased. The uh, left panel and the upper right are what it looked like um, when the farming stopped. The lower right was the site just before restoration took place in 2008. And then here's what we got a chance to do for the first time after a couple years of um, describing edge to edge disturbance to regulators, <laughs> to figuring out what to do with legacy pesticides, we got to do this. We got to do edge to edge disturbance for rejuvenation purposes. And this is what some of those pictures looked like. And our goal there was to make, frankly, just to make the site wet. A lot of the site was very dry. And immediately it started to look pretty good. This is what it looked like just less than a year after that, those mud flats that you saw. And then <clears throat> here's what it looked like seven years afterwards at the, about that same location. You can see filled in rather nicely. And then a little farther up in the headwaters, um, it really started to get nice. Um, with a dense moss layer, we had an international uh, peatlands expert on site who during our hour long walk around identified something like a dozen species of sphagnum moss on this site. So there's a lot of magic up close and a lot of good plant diversity and just a lot of buzz of life on this property. And that's seven years after the restoration happened. And then since that time, we've had the chance to do four more. You know, so um, we're still, the, the tools that we use are still developing. We're learning things on every project, but I think we have enough under our belt um, today to, to at least 
uh, uh, bring some tools to the table. Let's put it that way. So let's shift over to just talking a little bit about the, the backdrop or the context of what's happening. I think many of you are already going to be familiar with this, but I just want to put it on the table to inform our conversation. Um, obviously, the economics are what's driving the retirement, the wave of retirements that we're seeing right now in the region. We're at um, very low prices. It's very difficult to stay in business. Uh, there are other factors, of course, too, aging farmers, kids maybe that don't want to take over the farms. But the the economics are driving retirements, particularly for the low productivity sites that are wet and hard to farm and perhaps have the older varieties of berries where renovation to the newer varieties is not does not make sense. The other thing that's happening is there's political attention to this issue. Many, some of you may be aware that the state legislature had a task force a couple years ago, issued this report, made some findings, including um, recommendations for assistance, financial assistance to renovate parts of um, some fields that are more productive, and then also made a recommendation for conservation and restoration for those lower productivity fields. So we've been working since then to try to implement that recommendation. I, obviously, you know this part of the context, the, the significant development pressure, um, not only for these sites, but really for the entire region. At the same time, with climate change and sea level rise and coastal nitrogen, there are regional scale environmental issues and global issues that also are changing the context quickly. Um, you know, we're part of what we're doing is trying to focus in on some of the, the lower line bogs that may, may be suitable for marsh migration along river corridors, places where the ocean wants to come talk to the land and trying to transition those. Trying to think about how much nitrogen these restored sites removes so they can be part of cleaning up legacy nitrogen issues in groundwater. And then, um, the last part of the backdrop I'll offer is just that as we've gone through this past year, uh, I think we're at a time when public, the public is valuing nature and, pu and public open space more than ever, right? And all these present risks and opportunities, right? They're not just a driver in one direction. The other part of the, of the backdrop is just the, the fact that these, the farmland, this farmland takes up a large part of the region. I've exaggerated the borders on these sites a little bit to make them visible, but 13,500 acres of bogs. I don't know, I, I, some of you may know, but it's not just the, the bogs themselves, it's also the surrounding upland buffers that are critical here. And of course, these are the areas more subject to development pressure, but also offer the opportunity to protect at the same time to really create healthy wetlands that have an intact buffer in that transition between forest and wetland over time. Y'all are right up in there. So we'll talk about, we'll zoom in later and hopefully talk together about what's going on with these sites in your area. This is another point I wanna get across. Um, folks have been trying to think about the pace and scale of retirement of these farms. There's a paper that came out just a couple years ago by close colleagues um, that for the first time really makes a projection. So this is the one that I use when I'm trying to think about scaling our program to help. Uh, so approximately 5,000 acres of these farms might be vulnerable to retirement. This is based upon a regional GIS analysis that looked at things like location in the watershed, type of soils that they're underlain by, really took a deep dive on those that are not likely going to be able to compete in the marketplace and will either be abandoned or retire. So 5,000 acres. So that's over a third of the farmland that I just showed you on that map. That's a lot of land. And so as a result, this is what's happening. You guys are seeing this in your area too, I'm sure. Some of the ways in which um, some growers are finding a path to retirement is to sell off some of their land. This is entirely understandable in my perspective. Um, and so this is part of the change that's happening on the land right now. And obviously some of this is less desirable from an environmental perspective. This is the other thing that I'm seeing happening in the region and I'm sure you have sites like this where um, bogs are just, farm growers are just walking away, maybe for a few years, but perhaps permanently simply because the balance sheet doesn't work. And um, so, but this is bog abandonment. And this is what I often see, which is a pretty rapid transition to more upland species, really 
kind of residual wetlands in the ditches, which also as open stagnant dishes become mosquito habitat. And th this is a degraded wetland. So this has implications for what this could be if it was healthy in terms of water quality, soil development, carbon storage, water storage, and all the other good stuff we'll talk about tonight. And I, I showed you that picture, but I get this picture, I get this question all the time when I give these talks. And, and it's the situation that I see is that some farms will retain wetland characteristics upon retirement. Typically they're underlain by peat. They might have areas that sink. They might have a, thin, a thinner sand layer than other sites. So here's an example of a, of a site. This one's actually still actively farmed. And um, I'm sure you can see that those red maple trees coming in. That's gonna be a red maple swamp. So technically that is a wetland. So that will be a wetland. You, you, we can debate whether that's a, the best, highest quality wetland it could be, but it's gonna be a wetland. But I also in the region see sites like this, sites that are long abandoned, that have lost entirely the wetland characteristics. Mm -hmm. So this is really the motivator for this work. You know, we don't wanna do heavy intervention places that will stay wetland or stay quality wetlands, but places like this where really the trajectory is entirely toward upland communities, these are places for uh, intervention with restoration. And the reason that we see this after about 10 years of doing this, we think it boils down to these simple legacy impacts, we call them, because the impacts persist after farming stops. The most important one is the picture on the left. In, and this is my friend, Nick, he's in a pit, a test pit here. He's sampling the bottom dark layer of soil. That's the native wetland peat that was beneath this farm. In farming every few years, you add a little bit of sand, a couple inches. And so over a hundred years of farming, that probably builds up to 10 feet of sand, but it compacts. And so you get this highly compacted one or two feet of fill, anthropogenic fill over the wetland soils. And I'm sure many of you can, can tell me the difference in plant communities that would grow at that peat, wet peat layer versus the plant communities that would grow at that two foot higher dry elevation, right? The fill changes the surface hydrology, changes the plant community, changes it generally or in some places from a wetland that it was to more of an upland because of that fill, drying, drying fill impact. The other legacy impact that we see is the water control structures, the physical simplification, the dams, the plumbing system essentially on the site. Any questions before I move on? This can be interactive. I'm happy to entertain questions as we go through. Okay, I'll ask. I, I didn't understand what you meant about the, the water structure. Yeah. In terms of legacy. Yeah. So this thing in the lower right-hand corner is a dam. And if this farmer simply walked away and that remained in place, this is, this is a barrier to the free movement of water, which is gonna affect the health of that whole river system moving through there. The ability of critters to move around, it's gonna change the temperature. You know, it, there's a cascading effect from legacy infrastructure that remains in place, I, I particularly in a river system that depends on being free, free flowing. Yep, yeah, I got mm -hmm. it. Thank you, good question. All right, let's move on. So one of the main points I wanna get across to you guys tonight is that in light of those legacy impacts we just talked about, I think at this point we can assert that restoration can repair some of, some of these things and put these sites back toward a trajectory of being wetlands again in the future. And I'm gonna take a little bit of a dive into science and theory just to explain how we think about this. The, the place that always starts is a definition for me. You know, people are, using the word restoration for a lot of things these days. And I wanna be clear about what we mean. We use a definition from the Society for Ecological Restoration. And I really like this definition for many of the words in here, process, uh, ecosystem. You know, We could spend a lot of time in here talking about this uh, definition, but this is the one that I really like, assisting in recovery. It kind of has a nice humble tone. It says that we as humans cannot do everything. The best we can do is hope to put 
uh, degraded natural system back on the path toward being a healthier place in the future. So that's a great definition, assisting recovery. We as practitioners have to then translate that into what we're actually doing. So I'm gonna walk you through the logic of that quickly. We lean a lot on obviously the literature restoration ecology literature to, the gui to guide our approaches. This for me is a really important paper in my own thinking. I'll offer it to you for, if you really wanna get deep into river restoration and theory, this is a great paper to read. But what this talks about is what's critical in thinking about natural systems are biological, chemical and physical processes that, that allow, allow a system to build and maintain habitat on its own. Okay, and we could get into a deep dive, but I'm gonna simplify it to say that we're all tonight meeting about rivers and floodplains wetlands, but we've reduced this to say the key physical process that we're gonna, that we think is important is the movement and storage of water. So just tuck that away for a second as we march through this, movement and storage of water. That's what's critical for thinking about healthy rivers and wetlands. I noticed in the first slide deck that you guys were presented as part of this speaker series, this slide, and it really grabbed my attention. I just wanna dwell on it for a second. A resilient watershed is one that can adjust, and this is the, I'm gonna underline that part, can adjust to stresses and disturbance. Did you all spend time in that first conversation to talk about how exactly a natural system can adjust to stress and disturbance? What are the characteristics of a natural system that would allow it to do that? I mean, it's an interesting question. So I'm thinking about this for this talk with you guys tonight and this is, would be my answer. It's those intact processes that allow systems, it's like the engine of nature. If those processes are intact, then the, then the system, when things change, it can adjust. And the point I wanna to make to you is that restoration done right, especially using that process-based lens where you're focusing on repairing those processes, that is a very sensible way to try to create systems that can adjust to stress and disturbance over time. So that's the logic train I'm drawing for you. We then take it a step further. We need to put this into practice. So we've developed a, basically a recipe to help us look at a piece of land with folks like you, Linda, we're going to talk about this when we go out to your sites. And it's a five-step process. And we do, this is how we basically think about a site, design an intervention, and do a project. And it's only five steps. So you could, you could apply this anywhere on the ground in your town. And I'm going to walk you through it, then I'm going to show you an example of it. First is get to know the site. You need to work with it, not against it. Spend time getting to know the land. The second is figure out what, what part of the engine you want to pay attention to. And here it's the movement and storage of water. Then it gets really simple from there, identify what's occurred on the ground that affects the natural movement and storage of water. We'll call those stressors or limiting factors for recovery. Number four is plan ways of dealing with those limiting factors and do it. And then five is turn the keys over to nature and give it time. So it's really simple. It just says movement, storage, water, what's wrong, fix it, give it time. Easy. Dam removals are great examples of this. And we do a lot of dam removals at DER with partners around the state. And for those of you that may have a stream ecology background, you would tell me that habitat in a river system is formed with three things primarily. It's the movement of water, sediment and wood. Those are the things that build habitat in a stream. When you go to fish, flip your fly into a pool to try to get that trout to surface, someone didn't go out there and dig that pool. It was water bouncing off a log, digging into sediment and forming that pool. So those three things need, to, they, when they're moving freely in a river, rivers can build habitat and maintain it over time. It's dynamic. When you have a 20 foot wall in a river like this, Clearly those things don't move freely. You have, we had 15 feet of sand built up behind this and all the trees were built up behind it. So what's the solution? Remove the dam. This is what it looked like when we removed the dam. And I don't have an after picture, but within about a year, all this was green again. We had trees growing up in here. River's fixing itself. We don't have to do anything else. 
perfect example of process-based restoration. It's a little more complicated on a cranberry bog, so I'll step you through quickly the recipe here. This is a site that we just finished construction on in Plymouth. So here's um, a picture of the land just before restoration started. And this was a, a, a couple years after farming stopped. So the first thing we did again was getting to know the site. And this is what we would do. We, we try to do really on any cranberry farm. Here we are looking down at it in Google Earth. And what I'm showing you there are the results of a ground penetrating radar survey that our colleagues at NRCS did, where you drag literally a down pointing radar across this site. You get these cross sections. This is almost underground bathymetry. And what I'm showing you there are in this central area are kettle hole peat deposits that are 30 feet deep, 30 feet of soft peat that looks like this below that flat surface, right? So we walk, you walk out on that site and it looks like that. You have, it's only by getting to know the land that you can appreciate. There used to be these massive, massive kettle hole peat wetlands out there. So this is what I mean about getting to know the site. And this is a, a, a must do in my view uh, assessment when planning a cranberry bog restoration. We also like to interview the farmer that's worked the land for decades. This is an example of a map that I used to just download the local knowledge about how water moves and on and on. We put these together into conceptual designs, preliminary designs, permitting processes, final designs, bid them out to people that can move dirt. And we come up with a plan that looks generally like this. It shows where we're gonna do certain actions and those common actions to address things like the fill and the ditches that dry the site out are pretty simple. When there are ditches, where there are ditches, we fill them. Where there's a really thick cranberry mat that's dry, we're breaking that up. We're churning up the peat to bring the seed up. We're scraping some of the sand off to make open water in places. We're removing all the dams, taking out the dikes, except for me, where you want to preserve them for walking trails. We're getting the native seed bank going and then we're watching it grow. And again, we're just previewing this tonight, so we can have much more in-depth conversation when we start to talk about some of the places in your community. But let me show you then what this looks like. So this would be putting that into play. We've hired the contractor, we've raised the money, we're out on site. This is what it looks like to sit out there with the machine and start to break apart the cranberry mat to try to re get this surface moist again. Here we are, at this is Tidmarsh Farms uh, in Plymouth. Across the street, by the way, I didn't have after photos to show you from that last site, so I'm showing you across the road to show you some after shots. Here's what it looks like doing, during, doing the project. That same spot looked like that just a few weeks later. So literally by sitting there and breaking it up, that allowed springs to come up to the surface and start to rehydrate the surface there. We did that across much of the site and quickly saw that same response. Simply breaking up the mat allows some of the springs to come up and allows the land to really hold water on that top layer. This project involved creating a new stream channel. Out in the center there is where they're just starting to dig it. There's what it looked like kind of roughed in phase one of channel construction. There's, there's the end of our job right there. That's the, that, is the, that is completion of earthwork. There's wood placed, the soil's turned up. Um, it's, it's rough, there's wood scattered. We've got nice carbon on the soil. The seeds are ready to rock and roll. So we're done. And now this is what it looks like then. This is the fifth part I was talking to you about. Turn it over to mother nature and give it time. So this is just six, this is six months later at that same exact location. And this is all the seed that was underground. This is not seeded or planted. That's all just buried underground. It just was waiting for, waiting for the right conditions to become a wetland again. And so I don't think with this group, we need to dwell much on this slide. This is, this is the Eel River um, site in Plymouth, the first one we, we completed. This one's through this picture is three years after restoration. But obviously why does this matter is healthy wetlands do things for us. Store flood water, whether it's um, inputs, freshwater inputs from upstream or whether it's the ocean coming in to talk to the land these intact systems, intact floodplains can store that water. Over time, they develop rich soil with complex soil functions, including the ability to remove pollutants and nitrogen. Denitrification, as you all know, 
permanently takes nitrogen out of the water. It is a way of kind of addressing some of our legacy nitrogen issues in the region. This kind of site, obviously, you get some thank yous from the turtles and then you, this site is a town owned public open space. So now you bring in the, the people part of things, which is really a sweet spot and something I, I love. So next I wanna talk about land protection as this first step. So there are, the most common way this happens today is through a conservation, if it's a private farm, looking to make a choice between uh, one of those development paths and this path, the most common route right now is this program, the Wetland Reserve Easement Program through the Department of Agriculture. They set a per acre rate per year. So they pay a landowner a per acre rate for retiring from farming and putting an easement on their property, retiring the development rights and, and basically agreeing to do wetland restoration. So that's 13,600 an acre in Plymouth County this year. Now the problem is um, that program typically only has about enough funding to address 10% of the applications they get. So they got, let's say they get 10 applications a year, they only have the funding to do about one. So it's a good start, but they could use more resources. The second way these sites can get protected either um, singularly or in tandem with a, with a conservation easement is, subs is acquisition, direct acquisition by either a town, a land trust, someone who wants obviously to maintain the land for public open space. So this is what happened at the Tidmarsh site. Uh, Mass Audubon came in after the restoration was done, purchased it, it's now maintained as a sanctuary. For me, working with landowners, I really love this set up because it represents a double payment. Upfront payment for the easement, payment on the end for the acquisition. That seems like the right thing to me for families that have spent decades investing in the land and it's a suitable exit strategy in my view. So this, this whole transition, we, we've, been, we've dubbed the green exit strategy after that um, legislature's report, um, the task force that I mentioned to you. So it's, it looks like this. Private farmland, again, it's usually these lower productivity lands that are wet and hard to farm. Those are the ones that we're most interested in. Protect it, as I said, typically via this easement program, restore it, and then ideally manage it for public open space. So it's just a sim this simple transition. Now, sites can be in different places here. Um, I learned from Linda that you all own some, you already own as a town, some former farm. So you're already up here in the protected land place. So maybe we just need to have the next talk about this restoration space. So that's possible too. It can be anywhere in this process. To try to increase that capacity um, that I mentioned is lacking. We just were successful in winning this big federal award that I wanna make you aware of, the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. It's bringing about $10 million of federal investment to the table over the next five years. And again, we're keeping it simple. We're just trying to do more of these projects. So it's land protection, it's doing the wetland restoration, the design permitting and the building. The other two parts are innovation, working directly with the Cape Cod Cranberry Growers Association and growers to innovate in two important ways. The, the, the one I'll mention to you is trying to get um, growers into the construction industry, trying to get farmers with decades of experience, equipment and know-how moving around these sites to start to get, to be the ones to move the dirt. And um, I'm really excited about that. And then the fourth part is learning. And if we had more time tonight, I would talk to you about that. This has about been a 10 year effort with a lot of partners, researchers to assert questions and try to get answers that speak to the outcomes and help us improve practice. But we don't have time tonight, but we can come back to that. The, one of my key takeaways here, and we're coming to the close to the end here, is um, if there are projects out there is to get in the pipeline. Most of the projects, all the projects we're working on today, and there are about 15, were born two or three years ago. I'll meet someone like Linda, she'll tell me about a site, we'll go out and look at it together, We'll get excited about it and we'll start the path toward a dream of change. But these take time to develop and sometimes they take 
um, you know, they take really important conversations with the families who are making these once in a lifetime decisions. So um, our dance our dance card is, is, is pretty full right now. And so I'm encouraging people I talk to that if you have a, a project idea, let's start talking today, we'll queue it up. And, and that's how these happen. So how do you actually get to be part of this? Um, here's the contact information from my friend, Helen, who runs the easement program. Um, direct outreach to her is always fine for those looking to explore the mechanics of getting enrolling in the system, hearing more about the pricing, learning more about the, you know, the title search, boundary survey, all the stuff you got to do to do a real estate deal, which is what this is. I'm the point person for the state for the wetland part. And I'm always happy to go out and talk to people, walk sites. Linda and I already have a date. <laughs> and then um, some of this other stuff is in development right now, but the, the Growers Association is going to be a conduit um, at least we're planning on being a conduit for a lot of the innovation and, and kind of um, enrolling people who are considering, just so we know if we have an idea out, who's out there that might have, uh, might be interested in this down the road. Okay, so takeaway closing, and then we're gonna talk about your, your land. Takeaway message one is that the, low pro the lowest productivity farmland is in transition, and that is creating these risks and opportunities, risks of permanent wetland loss or persistent degradation, but also opportunities to create these vibrant, protected open spaces. The math, the equation you want to remember is land protection plus restoration equals dynamic, resilient, natural places. And that process-based lens for restoration that emphasizes that engine, that movement and storage of water, I'll argue with you is what creates a dynamic natural system. And then my last point, I'm just reiterating what I just said, get in the pipeline. So I have scanned your region. I'm excited to talk to you guys about what's going on locally. Um, I'm not prepared to offer much except uh, dialogue, but, I, but, I, but I've, I have spent some time looking around the landscape um, and welcome a conversation with you about how some of this might fit into you locally. And then I'll just end by throwing up my contact information and a pretty picture for me to exit with. So thank you guys. Great. Great. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you guys. So many relevant things because uh, Plimpton is one third or more wetlands. And a lot of those wetlands are bogs. And um, we just saw Brian Wick gave a, um, an overview of the state of the cranberry industry to uh, another group. And we sort of sat in on it. Oh. And he was, he was noting something, I'm not gonna, my figures aren't gonna be quite right, but he was saying something like 80% of the bogs basically are, are now owned by 20% of the owners are getting to be, you know, the big owners are taking a lot mm. of the bogs. And that the, as you say, on the lower end, people with uh, old, old species of cranberry can't right. make the conversion. So they're, you know, doing anything they can and wanna cash out and they wanna get some money and they need that. And in the middle, um, trying to hang on our bogs in about the 15 to 20 acre range. We have a fair number of those. I mean, of the bogs that we have in town, um, which I don't think we've ever enumerated. There are, we have a map in our open space plan that shows where they are and all that kind of stuff. Most of them are, are probably in that size. Some are mm -hmm. a little bit bigger. Um, and and the, the park that, that we just set up, that's close to your oval, you know, that you just, um, just to the left of your oval there, you'll see three old cranberry bogs in a reservoir just out. That's our new area. Nice. And opposite, opposite that, you will see across the street about 20 acres of bogs that, um, that are depauperate. I mean, they, they have no vegetation. They haven't been farmed in, I don't know, 30, 40 years. They look really dry, so like the Sahara. Uh, interesting. They're eroding into the, into the brook that goes through there, which goes through okay. our land, which connects to the Carver uh, watersheds and the Middleborough, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, those, um, so so that's sort of a problem for us is that we initially wanted your advice and still do to look at the uh, 35 acres of cranberry bogs we we now own and the, with the 20 acre reservoir, but I think our bigger or as big a concern is across the street these bogs that are no longer far farmed. It's owned by an elderly person who mm. wants to get out of the business 
um, and uh, is looking for a way out. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's sort of uh, in terms of timing, it's probably the most urgent thing for us to do is to try to figure out what options exist there to make a transition for that property um, and yeah. to give him some way to work with you, us, anyone to give him some options. There are a few yep. probably upward house lots around the edge there or something. Um, it is right behind the Middleborough landfill. Uh, there are some concerns that they have, they have had uh, wells there for 30 years that are doing measure, measuring water quality all the time. So that's where we could really use your help for, um, you know, both the bogs we, we own, but we could probably, you know, we'll have those for, it's really across the street that we're sort of worried about what can change. And that is coming from the headwaters and going through the, the land. Well, Linda, that sounds like a date, first of all. Um, and I think I see those on, as I mentioned to you, I've got Google Earth open because I'm that kind of nerd. Um, That's but good. I welcome you to send me pins exactly so I could see where they are on the map, just so I'm sure that. Um, I think your point that you made about the position in the watershed is an, is a good, is an interesting and good one. Um, and as you zoom out to see the whole landscape and start to see these patchworks, uh, patchwork of um, farms and think about which ones are retiring. You, know, you can start to think about a prioritization scheme. Where are those sites that are gonna have the most influence on either water quality or water quantity? You know, restored wetland in the headwaters can really help with base flow, for example, um, habitat links to other protected land and so forth. So, um, you know, maybe this is something that we um, I don't think we've done a town-wide bog prioritization. You know, it's usually opportunistic when a landowner comes forward, but um, you're working with the master planner here, um, <laughs> Bill. So, I, you know, maybe there's a way to think holistically here about what's coming down the road. But well, we can certainly go see these sites. Yeah, we don't have, I, we look in the open space, but we have the bogs. They're owned by relatively few owners. Mm, I mean, okay. Hardy Brothers, if you know that name. They, yeah, they own, of course. They own land, all, bogs all over the place. And mm -hmm. they're very involved. Uh, Larry was going to try to be on tonight, but we probably screwed it up with our confusion. But he's, um, he's on uh, the preserve that we just bought has two brooks going through it that connect right away to the Winnetuxet, which goes into the Taunton. And that's part of this 20,000 acre, highly valuable ecological yeah. area the state loves. Um, Larry Harge is looking what to do with his bogs. You know, he owns a lot in Plimpton, yeah. Carver, you know, um, and he owns land, he owns bogs right on the river. Another landowner just down the way does, you know, has an interest too. So we have a lot of sort of receptive open people here who are sort of wondering what to do mm -hmm. and, you know, figuring out with you what happens next, maybe a townwide assessment of you know, possibilities and a special outreach to them would be something, I don't know, but we're open. Well, there's nothing like a success, the f a first successful project in a community to yeah. generate interest in doing more. Yes, so. you're reading my mind, young man. <laughs> we were talking, Linda and I were talking the other day about a prioritization and ranking criteria for the lands, shaping our portfolio. Like yeah. any good investor who's representing a client, we have to look at what we have, what our assets are, where we can make our investments and, uh, so we were talking about that. And the, the, the thing that's interesting about the bog that Linda was describing, you and I were talking before, the headwaters of Whetstone Brook really would impact North Carver, Northeast Middleborough, and are right at the tail end of that huge 20,000 acre parcel of continuous yeah. habitat. That's about, I think it's in the, the top five in the state as far as intact habitat and overall yeah. importance to the region as far as resiliency, habitat, continuity, so yeah. it, it's a nice project. And like Linda nice. was saying, it hasn't been farmed in a long time. There are, you know, erosion, stabilization issues, bank restoration issues. Yeah, I think let's put this, um, you know, when you guys are ready, let's put this new relationship into action. I think let me know some sites and then let's make a date and go see them. And we can talk, we can tell a lot about a site and its potential from, um, from looking at it from space, from looking at different data layers. Um, there are tricks of, to, to looking at these sites, even just using Google Earth back in time, you can kind of start to see where some of the sites are underlain by peat and, and those that maybe are drier because not, not all of these sites are restorable. You know, some were cut out of uplands. And so I'd be curious to know if that one that you say is 
bone dry with nothing growing in it, it, it could be that there's no, there's no historic wetland underneath it. And that's part of getting to know the site as a first step. Yeah. I was going to say, Rick, it is, it is based in uplands, you think, mostly there? I believe, I believe it is. I believe yeah. it is. Majority of it. I went back and looked at the 1897 topo maps, so it looked fairly dry. Plain detective, yeah. Historic maps is the yep. best good way to start a plain detective, exactly. Yeah. Very similar to our parcel, which is across the street, the contours anyway. So mm -hmm. you can see you just jump in. more and after. So some people just have an affinity for digging and removing. And that's what's happened across the street. So. Yeah. It's it's all about the water and uh, following the Whetstone Brook back beyond our own lands that we've just protected and then going back to this dry area. It does go on back. The um, carbon. I think Alex has made a very good point about the it's all about the water part. Absolutely. Just give a, a plug. I'm a, a Clinton resident and these are all my friends, the open space and the, uh, the, the various committees, Conservation Commission. But I work in Manomet, Massachusetts, just downstream from the, uh, from the area that, that Alex has been talking about. And I'd like to give a plug in having Alex, who came out with us to our rather small bogs. Helen Castle came along. One of his folks, who is more local, I forget his name, Alex, came out. Mm -hmm. And we just had this excellent advice for some very small bog areas that we have. And now three or four or five years later, we have managed to retain a lot of the, uh, the, the water. It's all about the water. We've used a lot of the old cranberry dams. And we are now installing um, trails around for the public. And again, I'd like to stress that once we've produced these areas, the first goal after that, and after you've got something, is to open it up to the folks so that all the, all the people in our towns can, can really come and enjoy this. We have school groups coming into our bird observatory anyway, college groups, adult groups, all sorts. But now they're going to walk through an old cranberry farm that goes back to the late 1700s. And they're going to wander their way up a trail. They're going to stop off in the bird blind and look at our biggest bog that we've now flooded into a marshland. We do a little restoration with a brush mower about once a year, it's not terrible. We mow the grasslands about once a year so that we maintain some of the original grassland and the whole thing is restoring itself back. So I'd just like to give a, a plug to talking to Alex, talking to Helen Castle, these folks, and they've really helped us. Thanks Trevor, that's nice. And I certainly applaud your, your efforts on your site. I think what it tells me is that there are different, there, we, there are a range of tools in our toolbox and the things that I showed on the screen tonight are certainly um, on the high, on the more expensive side, the higher end, the big yellow machines, the lots of large wood. But there are also there are all sorts of solutions. Some of not all of them are involved that much intervention. Mm -hmm. Simply pl plugging ditches on some sites is going to eliminate a mosquito hazard and help rehydrate a site. So uh, we have much to learn and, and do and try in the region. Sure. Well, Alex, whenever we can get you down here, it'll be you'll have a troop going out with you. <laughs> oh, good. Well, look, so, these projects uh, happen only with groups of friends. So yeah, that's critical so, to uh, establish at the start. Yeah. So anytime you can come, I think you're going to find that, you know, you have an ardent welcome. To oh, the good. Thank you. And uh, lots of questions. And, um, and really, you know, we've done the best we can to try to understand them a little bit. But this is this part of town and doing these things in the bogs hands on is new. We just officially acquired this thing. I forget, my time goes by, I, maybe in the last year. Uh, so we're just beginning. It's not even open to the public officially yet. We're just beginning to think about management. Oh, and good. Then, great. Good time to go down and see it. it. Good. It is. But, but across the street is this, uh, you know, is this private citizen who has to make a plan for his future. And, uh, yeah. you know, he, he, needs, he needs to get something going fairly quickly uh, so that he has some options to consider. So that's maybe okay. more urgent in terms of things we can't control in terms of time. So, Julianne, uh, Julianne, did you have your hand up? Uh, yeah, I do. My question's more general about the process as a whole. Mm -hmm. So is there any major difference between the amount of carbon that can be sequestered from a natural bog versus the restored bog? Oh, Julianne, I don't have the answer to that. And neither do my research colleagues yet. But that is a question that is being investigated. Mm -hmm. um, we've had We've had the pleasure of working with EPA, Mount Holyoke College, people that have come out to these sites and put these domes 
down to measure off gassing and you know are much know much more about this than I do. I think the punchline that I've taken away is that when we restore wetlands on some of these drier sites, we get we get a burst of methane. Yeah. So there's a there's not a great greenhouse gas story immediately as we rewet these dry sites, but in the long term, as we track things like soil development we get, we transition to a net carbon sink over time. Mm -hmm. You know, and these take, this can take years or decades, decades to make that switch. So, but yeah. these are old natural systems. This, this, this stuff takes time, especially with this kind of disturbance event. So I think that's how at least I carry around the findings to, so far. Yeah. That's right. As an yes, I would totally agree. Um, what we are doing is instead of having a runoff down channels through the middle of bogs and then off down the watershed, uh, we are sequestering that water with wetland vegetation. And as that grows mm -hmm. back into herb layer and shrub layer and eventually tree layer in, in yeah. appropriate places, that is sequestering carbon. Yeah. Know, exactly as Alex says, long term it'll work. Um, short term, you get a perturbation, but it's worth it. Well, it's really cool because as you restore a wetland, it, it's just like you said, Trevor, you, you grow this dense crop of wetland plants, then they mm. fall over. And then you grow yeah. a dense crop of plants and they fall over. And then you, you, know, you start to layer organic matter. And I mean, hopefully we can all go on a tour of a site like Eel River in Plymouth, the oldest one, it's now 11 years uh, post. You can dig a core in there and you can pull out, you know, you pull out inches of new well in soil, it's, it's 10 years worth of carbon and a thick layer of sphagnum moss. It just, I mean, that's what makes this so um, rewarding. That's, yeah, that's the fun part. I, I have a bureaucratic question. <laughs> um, <laughs> are there, <laughs> they call me the red tape queen for a reason. Mm -hmm. um, Wait, I'm the, I think I'm the red tape king. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny, okay, good. Um, do we have uh, any, any deadlines we should be paying attention to? Is it so early in the process? I mean, we just need you to eyeball this thing and then yeah. we need to think about what we're doing. Um, and we're, we're not, you know, we don't have a, a, a vast staff of um, X, mm -hmm. Y, and Z to help prepare all this. Mm -hmm. Although Bill, Bill pulls miracles out of the air all the time. So, but so any, yeah. any deadlines or anything we should be thinking about? Yes, and thank you for, uh highlighting a glaring hole in my presentation to you tonight because I should have said I should have given you that exact next step so for the for my program to get state assistance we do have an upcoming application period it's mm -hmm. going to open up probably at the in early April and run through early May so there's a there's actually an application window that's just on the horizon and that's to become what's called a priority project Yep. with my shop with der um that you know it those those happen every couple years so it might not be this might be too soon that doesn't rule out the future it's all based on our staff capacity and like i said we're already pretty oversubscribed with the limited staff that we have of, we're trying to build that up but um you know i'm happy to try to get out there in the next couple of weeks and take a quick look together or at least send me a pin it's like Make, send me a yeah. pin so I can definitely make sure I'm looking at the right site and give you, I can give you kind of a quick diagnosis on how it would compete in well, the short term. And even I'll turn, I'll, thinking about if we can't, if we aren't ready for that slot, yeah. maybe we can daydream with you about what alternatives do we have to sort of, you know, we can't wait three or four years to maybe make some arrangements, for, you know, so what are the backup options for m moving into the... You don't have to be a state project to advance thinking about uh, restoration. You right. already have this great group, I can tell, of nature detectives. And so with a little bit of interaction, we could say, well, how do we need to get to know the land? And you all could fan out on that over the next year. And we could, you know, there's all sorts of ways to move the needle before you become a formal project. Yeah. And it's was, kind of fun too, frankly. I was just thinking also, Alex, with, um, you know, speaking to, to um, Linda the other day, it would be worth it to go through the exercise of putting together a letter of interest yeah. in free RFR. I think so just too. To, just to organize the project, yeah. you know, in your head and on paper, what you want. And then if, you know, if by some, you know, miracle you could get out there in, in you know, a good time, get out there and look at it. But if not, at yeah. least submit the project or, or the letter with maps, with a little bit of background, like you said, doing 
the local detective work because these guys are fabulous. They know every inch of the town. And um, that, that way you could get it in and look at it and give them some sage advice. And it, it, it could be the one or it could be like, let's, let's work on it a little more, but then you have it down. I think it's great. I don't know if it'll be sage advice. It'll be advice, but um, <laughs> you guys definitely, that's, that's sage advice is the application is really easy. It's, it's only three pages long. It's just plain language. It's, it's not technical. You just need to express in plain language what you want to do and who you are and your relationship to the land. You're the owner. So you have control over what happens here. So caveat in, in this one case that we're interested in, we're not the owners. Right. So you wouldn't be able to apply for help on that one unless you had the owner consent to this type of work. But on your site, the, the one that you've recently acquired, uh, that's we now park, we could, you know, but it's just building that relationship with that landowner in the future. Right. Yeah. I, might, I might just make, make a comment. I, I understand Linda's urgency on the bogs across the street from the ones we have and maybe the urgency of deadlines. I love the point, uh, Alex uh, and Bill, you made that maybe the best selling point to other bog owners is a successful first project. So I feel like the urgency is yeah. there. If we can do one of these projects and show some of these fellas and their families how yeah. successful we can be, it starts yeah. selling itself. Mark, that's a great point. And that's something you can put in your application. That kind of town-wide thinking and leadership to make use of a pilot project to try to promote that scale of change, I would suggest noting in the application, Mark. I think that's a, that's a great approach. Is it Prospect Bog Reservoir? Is that what this is called? If yeah, I'm looking, it used to be called it. that, so it would be on the map called that. Got it. Okay, cool. Thank you. And the, and the bogs around it. Okay, got it. But not to be greedy, but if, if since since we um, greedy can be good, if we yeah. apply as part of the town, you know, for the, yeah. the land we own, and if this owner was willing to sign a letter on his own behalf, I would have to look at what he'd have to commit to, and because you know he's not a he's not a corporation either. He's one eighty four year old man mm -hmm. <laughs> who wants out of the business. Mm -hmm. So I mean, is there a way to open a door to also, you know, help? at least elucidate or work with or you know have some discussions about that future as well yeah i mean i i think that if, since that's still privately owned i think you would start there with that land protection phase and really wanting to explore mm -hmm. for example with nrcs whether that site might be suitable for an easement if this individual or their family if if they're nearing retirement i suspect that some type of compensation for making this choice would be a helpful thing. And this is what this program is intended to do. So. Yeah, I think, you know, going at that, we were talking about that too, Alex, protection of the headwater stream, especially in this watershed where everything flows into a federally designated wild and scenic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, that mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of things there that you have going for you and you may be able to secure it through an easement and then you have the ability to work on it over time and really put your project together. Yep, yeah. I think that's it. Okay. I, I think if we're, you know, if, if, to, to, as we were saying, to have one project kind of showing people what you can do, I, I would argue we should do that on the land that the town owns and not on, yeah. I understand the, other, yeah. the impact of that other person's land on a lot of things. But we, we already own the land. People are jonesing to get in there and see what we do. That I, I think that should be the focus and and you know maybe work toward an easement or somehow thing else with the, the guy across the street. But I, I don't think that's the priority project mm. here. In yeah. terms of bang for your buck, in terms of PR, um, people having public access to the land and, and seeing that beautiful land become more beautiful. So. Yep. But we could yeah. potentially do, bo do both because yeah. you're going to have to yes. you know, forge a good relationship with the landowner. He may yeah. be very willing, but concentrate on yours. And I agree with Alex and everybody. Once you do have a good project to show people, I mean, right now, Alex can drive people around the bogs that have been restored down yeah. here and people are blown away. I mean, they'll, they'll come from halfway across my district to go see these things. <laughs> so if, if you have something, that's great. But in the meantime, oh, yeah. the fact that it may be going on across the street and the fact that this gentleman may be eligible for, you know, for an easement, conservation easement, wetland restriction easement with the feds, whatever, 
it's always good to start forging that relationship because then he can see what you're doing too and say, this could be you too, or we could do something else to make you, uh, you know, and he's conservation minded, you know, to, to fulfill your conservation wishes. And it's not only going to impact us, it's going to impact our neighbors in Carver and Middleborough. So you, you're actually doing a higher good. And I will say that we don't have, you know, we don't have any, and we have not had any projects in your town yet. Um, I think that it is always great, as Bill just said, or Middleborough. I'm looking around. We have one going in Carver right now, but you're right. In, you're right on the northern tip of the heart of Cranberry Land here, and so I'm, you know, super keen on um, some local demonstration sites to show it's possible. It's, it's easy to drive a mile to go see something beautiful. You know what's missing? Oh, I was going to say, what's neat too, Alex, is so we have the green infrastructure maps for the Commonwealth now. It was developed by our buddies at Manimit. Eric Wahlberg and Neil mm. Williams talked about that. And this area of Plimpton is probably the richest in uh, important green infrastructure for resilience oh, in this nice. part of the watershed. Yeah. So these, yeah. these are the types of things you really look at, you know, and when you talk about working with your neighbors, because Very the, nice. land, the land knows no political boundaries. They don't care. Doesn't care whether it's in Plimpton, Middleborough, or Carver. It's, it's the land and how it functions. Well, in you know, because this would be a town sponsored, you know, you all would have access to some funding sources that, um, like the MVP program that's we're you know you're using for this engagement, um, that obviously also funds actions like restoration on old cranberry box. So I don't know what the state of your plan is, but. Um, that's certainly the type of restoration action that um, they're looking to su support also. Yep. We, got the we have a lot of future council yeah. involved too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The MVP report from SERPED and the, all the colleagues is due in early July or mid July. And we're getting all this incredible information. And um, oh, so we're going to have a lot of, you know, neat opportunities and things to consider, you know, how priorities and what do we do first and, lots of needs, but uh, we're excited to be able to start considering all this now um, and, and putting some priorities on it. Um, so we'll see. I mean, my concern on the, on the Dickie Johnson is his name across the street. Mm -hmm. That's, a, that, those are canalized right now. You know, there would be, if, uh, if the land gets sold for other purposes, you know, restoring that stream naturally. Mm -hmm. uh, so even if the project didn't occur right away, I'm, I think it's worth investigating if there's a way for the town or some other, some other friendly source to hold a good part of that land so that the, the stream can be restored to a natural condition, even if we don't do it for four years. Yeah. Because uh, he's looking to exit. There are other, as we get to know each other more, we can um, share ideas for funding. There are other funding streams that can be used for land acquisition for this purpose. Um, I'm sure you know of ones I don't know about, and I probably know a few you don't know about. So we can have that sharing yeah. moment. Yeah. So, so I, I hopefully it's not an either or of doing them. It's just, you know, mm -hmm. trying to put your finger mm -hmm. in the dike, so to speak. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. An opportunity. One of the takeaways that I got from Alex's presentation that I didn't know um, was the the breaking up of those layers of sand above what was natural bogland or what was wetland down below, and uh, that really opens it up. The other thing is the natural spring restoration, and uh, I suspect there are natural springs running back. I did have a question on the foothills preserve, Alex, right mm -hmm. across Headmarsh. I notice you're delving out a lot of pools in that nice bogland that you discussed. We are, yeah. What is the water source coming into that? Is that from the terminal moraine above in the Pine Hills? That's right. It's, it's groundwater that is emerging at the toe of that slope there, right? That's all just groundwater. And there's, we removed sand over some of the large peat deposits there. And so you're seeing what we'd expect. Groundwater comes up, hits that peat, comes up right on the seam, springs. Very wet site now. Yeah. yeah that was Great. Great. Other comments here? We're... I've got a question for Alex. Um, if you, I know when you come out to visit our site, our Two Brooks site, um, I'm currently holding water on those bogs. Mm. Um, just to, you know, it's not growing season now, but we're trying to retard maple growth and everything right. else. Would you, would you rather see them dry to, for your evaluation or? 
no, that's not necessary. Um, I don't want to make work for you. I oh. think just getting the eyeballs on it and whatever state it is is just fine. Yeah. We'll we'll poke some holes in the ground. We'll bring out a shovel and we'll dig a couple holes. That's what I want to do with you guys and right. see how deep the sand is and see what's underneath. And it's fine to leave it as is right now. Sure, sure. We've got a little bit of history on you know which sections were rebuilt last, so we know perfect all that stuff. I get the sense you're going to be the lead detective on untangling the history of this really? site. I'm yeah, hoping to get you with something. So, <laughs> I'm looking forward to setting a date. Please, uh, please, you know, do that with Linda. Set a date, and we'll we'll be there. Good. Me too. Yeah. We, if we do it soon enough, maybe we won't get too covered with ticks either. But and that's good. Yeah. Good point. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to start trying to coordinate on dates as soon as you guys would like. So. Yeah, Rick is connected to. Uh, right. I think every farmer and landowner in Plimpton knows knows the history of a lot of the land, knows how to read it. He's, um, yeah, you know, it's uh, he's essential to any field visit we're going to do. Great. So. I, I'll look forward to it. So, All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. I, I can't thank you enough, Alex. Thanks for coming out tonight and uh, look forward to working with you down the line, obviously, and here in other places. My pleasure, guys. I get the sense this is a pretty fun group to work with, which is always a good start. Thank you. You well, get to choose where you work you want to work with, nice and folks, so you guys fit that bill. So looking forward to it. Okay. All right. Thank you a lot. Interesting yeah, presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Have a nice evening. You too, Alex. Thanks.